In this video, I'm going to give you five quick tips about Node-RED, including enabling dark mode, error handling, and rate limiting. So let's get stuck in. Node-RED doesn't actually have a dark mode by default, so what we're going to do is, is we're going to install a palette in Node-RED and then amend a config file to enable it. So let's take a look. So let's go into Node-RED and you can see that Node-RED has got a white background at the moment. So to enable dark mode, we're going to go up to the hamburger menu, manage palette, and then we're going to go to install and install a certain palette. So the palette we need to install is this Node-RED Contrib Themes. We're going to click install and then install again. Now that we've got the palette installed, we need to amend a config file. So I'm going to use Visual Studio Code Editor, but if you've got a different editor, then use that instead. So I click here. And then if we go to the config folder and then Node-RED folder, there's a file called settings.js. So we need to open that and go to the bottom. And then you'll see here there's editor theme. So if we look at the GitHub repo for this, you can see that we need to edit this section and we need to put the name of the theme. There are a few different themes, but I'm just going to do the dark one for now. So we need to make sure we put it in the right place. So after this bracket here, let's copy and paste this. Then you need to put a comma after it to make sure it's valid JSON. And then you need to remember to change this enabled to true and then save the file. We now need to restart the Node-RED add-on for it to take effect. So let's go to settings, add-ons, Node-RED, and restart. Now that Node-RED is restarted, let's click in it. Okay, not right now. And there we go, we've got a black Node-RED. Now let's try changing the theme to another theme. So I'm going to go back to the code editor, and in here, if we look at the documentation, if you look here, you can see that theme scroll bars are available as well. So you need to add this on the end. So let's do that. Paste that, save that, restart the add-on again. Now let's go back into Node-RED again. And you can see this time it's got much nicer looking scroll bars. So that's how you enable dark mode in Node-RED. It's a shame there's not a toggle for this, but at least you can do it. You're probably not likely to flip between light mode and dark mode very often anyway, really. A bonus tip here is if you go up to the hamburger menu again and go to settings, you can see that you can enable and disable the grid and also enable and disable the snap to grid. So I quite like to do this sometimes. I often have the grid on, but I think actually it's nice and clean with the grid off. I'm now going to talk about link in and link out nodes. These are really handy for organizing your flows and making sure you don't have too much duplication. Let's have a look at the two different nodes in Node-RED. So here I've got a link out node and it links to a state event node. So basically what I've got here is, is any motions that's detected so it does a check for entities that have got the word underscore presence in it. And if the state is on, it will send a message to the next node in the flow. In this case, the next node is a link out node. And then in here you select which link in nodes you want it to link to. So in this instance, I've got two link in nodes on different flows, one in the lounge and one in the bedroom. So let's click to lounge. And then you can see here, there's then a switch node, which checks message.topic within the message, and it checks for the entity, so that motion detected within the lounge is the only thing that then triggers the next node. In this case, it's just a debug node. And then likewise with the bedroom. So if we click here, it takes us to the bedroom one. There's a check here to see and make sure it's the bedroom present sensor. And then in this instance, it just triggers a debug node, but normally obviously you'd get it to turn a light on or something like that. So if I go back here, what I've done is, is I've created these inject nodes just to test it out. 
So message.topic gets populated with this entity and in this example with this entity. But normally this would be sent from this message if motion was actually detected in the house. So if I click lounge motion, then you'll see over here a message has been generated on this lounge debug node. And if I click here, you can see it takes us to the debug node so you know which node it was that generated that message. If I go back again, click the bedroom motion one, and you can see that generates a message. One of the scenarios I use this for in my automations is for the Xiaomi gateways. I've got the Xiaomi gateways connected in Node-RED and then every time they generate a message, it goes to some link out nodes and then to lots of other link-ins in other flows. This is a fairly simple example of using the link-in and link out nodes, but there's lots of other use cases too. For example, if you were turning a light on and off, a certain light, you might have that linked just to one link-in node and then you would have that triggered from lots of other automations where you want to turn that light on. The next quick tip is the junction node. Thanks to someone who left a comment about this junction node because I didn't know it existed until then. So let's show you what it is. So if you look here again, you can see that there's three nodes here and they all go into one node. So we've got three wires. You've got to connect them all individually normally. However, if you right click and do insert, you can see you can create a junction node. And what this allows you to do is connect multiple things to one node. So if we take this here and delete these wires, now we can connect these up like this, hover over it and then click there, hover over it and click there, hover over it and there. And now you can see we've got this nice little node we can move around that goes into the next node. So it's a nice little way of organizing. You can now see that using this junction node means that if you were to change things upstream, you would only need to delete this one wire instead of the three wires. The next tip is around error handling. So in Node-RED, you don't normally get errors on nodes as such. You normally get say empty payloads or the wrong information if you've done it wrong. But occasionally you can actually get an error against the node itself and it will stop the flow from working. This can happen, say, for example, if you've got a node where you input some information to the next node, so say an entity that doesn't exist, for example. So in this situation, if that node errors, you might not know that it's happened and the flow stops working. So there's a node called the catch node, and that's what we're going to talk about now. So if you look here, I've created an example. So here's the catch node, and then it's attached to a debug node just so we can see what's going on. At the top here, I've created an inject node, which is simulating a message that's being sent from somewhere. It could be, say, sent from an MQTT broker or something like that, where it passes in an entity. And then the next node is a current state node, so it would check that entity and see what the current state is. And if it's on, it would turn the fan on. But here, because I've got an unknown entity, then it means that this node here is actually going to error. So if I press this, you will see that it says not found and that's created an error. And what's happened is, is over here we've got a message from the error node from the debug node here. So this here has caught the exception and then it's passed on to the next node, whatever that is, in this case, a debug node. So if I double click this, you can see here, you select which nodes you want to catch the errors for. So I've selected get state in this instance. A situation where I've used this to trap errors is when I created a Slack app. So I created a Slack app where you could type in an entity and it would return the state of that entity. However, if you typed in an entity that didn't exist, then it would come up with an error. So what I needed to do is trap that error and then I needed to respond back to the user to say that the entity didn't exist. You probably won't need to use this catch node very much, but it's worth knowing about because if you do start getting some errors on your flows, then at least you know how to catch the errors and to do something with them. The next thing we're going to talk about is rate limiting. And this uses the delay node. This is one of my favorite nodes and I use it a lot because it can do delays and rate limiting. So let's take a look and build a flow. So here's the delay node. So let's drag this onto here. And then we're also going to drag an inject node. And then we're going to drag a debug node. 
Right, so now we've got these three, we're going to link them up. On here, I'm going to name it something else. So we'll call it delay. And we'll change this to complete message. So by default, it just shows you the message.payload is the debug. But we want the whole message because that's more useful. And now I'm going to deploy this. And then if I click this here, you can see that this is running. And then after five seconds, it's going to output to here. So this is how you use it as a delay node. And if you double click into it, you can select seconds, minutes, hours, milliseconds, etc. But if you go into action here, then you can change it to rate limit. And that's what we're going to look at now. So you can rate limit all messages or by a topic. So message.topic, if it receives a different string within message.topic, then it will rate limit per topic, which is really handy. So for now, we'll just do it on all messages because we've only got one inject node here and we're only going to be sending one topic. And then what we can do is, is we can choose how long it rate limits for and how many messages. So for example, if we say we can have two messages within 10 seconds, and then we can say either drop those intermediate messages or you can wait. So let's leave it as drop intermediate messages and click done. Now let's deploy that. If you click this here, then you can clear all the messages. So now if I press this, you'll see a message comes through. However, if you press it again, a message doesn't come through which you might think it would because two message every 10 seconds. However, it's a bit confusing. What it actually means is, is that you have to divide this by this to see how many messages you can have per interval. So in this instance, you would only get one message every five seconds. So if I keep pressing this for the next five seconds, you will see that the messages are five seconds apart. So this is basically the same as setting it as one message every five seconds. I think personally it would be better if they could actually change it so that it allows two messages within the 10 seconds and then drops messages after that, but it doesn't work like that. There's lots of uses for rate limiting, but one use is for restricting things like motion events. So motion events can happen really quite frequently and you might not want them to keep triggering automations. So you can use this to limit how often they run. I think this is one feature that's missing from Home Assistant really. As far as I know, Home Assistant automations, you can't really restrict the amount of time something happens within an automation. You can restrict automations running simultaneously and things like that, but you can't actually say, right, at this point in an automation, wait for this long and not either drop the messages or not, and then continue. Another situation where I might use this is rate limiting against APIs. You don't want to accidentally send loads of API queries to an API server, especially if it's under-resourced or if you've got a limit on the amount of API calls you can make. Let me know in the comments if you use the delay node and if you use it for rate limiting at all, and if you use it for any use cases that I haven't mentioned. And the final thing I wanted to mention is the comment node. I highly recommend you use the comment node because I find that you can create automations and get quite complicated in Node-RED. So whenever you create a complicated flow, make sure you use a comment node and put in there as much information as possible so that when you refer back to it months or even years later, you know what it does. I hope you learned something new in this video. If you knew most of those already, then well done you. But stay tuned because there'll be more videos coming soon on Node-RED. Well, that's it for today. So thanks until next time.